Okay. So welcome back to the second part of our first day of the symposium. So I'd like to, um, so there's been a change in the schedule that's on the, uh, on the handout. So we'll have the talk by Dr. Eric uh, Laux. Uh, Eric is a professor of, uh, as you see up there, Epidemiolo Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Behavioral and Social Sciences at Brown University. He's also director of the Mindfulness Center that started there. I believe, I believe you started the Mindfulness Center, this. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's also lovely, uh, Eric and I were uh, in the same Sangha, lay Sangha together in 2002, 2003, Boston Old Pass Sangha before I was a monk and before he was a professor. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very beautiful to have this kind of coming together of our two paths over the past 20 years and, and meet again here at Deer Park. Um, and he's also a member of the, uh, he received ordination in, to the Order of Interbeing many, more than a decade ago, right? Or, yeah. So without further ado, Dr. Eric Laux. Maybe we'll start with the sound of the bell. So this is going to be a bit experiential. Um, so what are the big behaviors that drive your well-being? If we think of, say, health behaviors, as V shared, he um, does what Lillian encourages him to do. And so for me, one of the behaviors might be diet that drives well-being, for example, and Lillian's done great work around that. What are other behaviors that drive your well-being? So, say that again. Movement, yeah. Movement or physical activity. Others? Relationships, fostering relationships, sleep, oh, that's a big one, what else? Time in nature, yeah, we're getting lots of that here. Something of the mind, say that again, the m laughter, the mind. Okay. Spiritual. Okay. So why don't we maybe pause there? I'll maybe add in one more big driver uh, of well-being can also be um, like alcohol and substance use, especially if they're addictive. Um, so. Raise your hand if you have all of these behaviors optimized. <laughs> so not a single hand. Um, so I would even invite you to consider maybe one behavior that you might like to have some change, if there is one that you would like to change, and maybe just hold that lightly 
uh, during this talk. Um. Okay, uh, yeah, diet, movement, relationships, sleep, time in nature, laughter, spiritual, alcohol and substance use. Um, some people talk about like digital media addiction, though I'm careful around my wording after the last talk by Vish. Uh, and if there's elements of uh, some more specifics that Vish talked about, you could think about that too. Okay, uh, so you know, when we think about behaviors that influence well-being, how could mindfulness help? shift behaviors. We often think about mindfulness training to help us, say, mental health. And it's talked about some with physical health, um, but in the research community can be less so, including how it can help with fostering healthy behaviors. And so this is a framework developed by uh, Judd Brewer, uh, who's also at Brown University, and it's called the Habit Loop. It's based on um, reward-based learning, uh, but say if uh, we have some kind of negative cue, like say we're yelled at by a boss, we might have um, negative emotions as a result of that and perhaps crave just doing something to release those negative emotions. So maybe that something is just like taking a break and having a cigarette like outside to <laughs> get away from it all for a little bit, or maybe like trotting down to the vending machine and getting a chocolate bar and just like having a chocolate bar. And, and then that can result in um, uh, uh, less negative emotions, uh, which then give us the feedback, so anytime anyone yells at us, we might go have a smoke or go get a snack. We can also have uh, positive cues, like say we eat a meal, and then wouldn't it be nice to have dessert? And so we maybe have some dessert that gives us some positive emotions that, you know, lead to the, um, the craving to have that, that dessert, and then that gives us even more positive emotions so that the next time we eat, we like to have dessert, or maybe we'd like to have a cigarette afterwards. And, and then these habits get made, and, uh, and they kind of reinforce themselves. And so what do we do about it if we want to break that habit or shift that habit? And so sometimes we try to avoid the cues, but we can't always do that. We can't always avoid somebody yelling at us or avoid eating. And uh, sometimes we can substitute behaviors. So say maybe instead of having a cigarette, we'll have a carrot stick, but that doesn't always work um, all the time. Uh, and so what Judd talked about is, you know, can we use mindfulness to basically disrupt the link between the craving and the behavior? So that can we just be there with the craving? And uh, even as um, Ty has shared, you know, can we care for it and understand its roots? And often if we don't give it a whole lot of energy, that craving will pass in about 60 to 90 seconds. And he's done quite a bit of research actually showing decoupling um, of this with mindfulness training. So that's one framework of how mindfulness could potentially help with behavior change. And another framework is this one developed by Yi Ying Tang and Britta Holtzel and colleagues where they basically talk about, whoops, got a little excited there. Let me just pop it back up. It's the wrong button. Uh, so they talk about how mindfulness meditation training uh, can basically help us self-regulate better. Uh, so for example, it may improve our self-awareness as we're going through meditation training, becoming more aware of like our thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations. And then we can direct that awareness towards our relationship with different behaviors in the context of this mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program that we developed. Uh, there's a number of behavioral determinants drivers of hypertension, like physical activity or diet or alcohol use, for example. And so can we bring that self-awareness to our relationship with those particular behaviors? So for example, when we're eating, you know, say for me, I have a sweet tooth uh, and it also makes me agitated. Um, so I have a complicated relationship with sugar. Um, so say if I go into a bakery and there's all these like delightful like baked items there, maybe donuts or whatever, and I might like look at that donut, just be there with the emotion and the thoughts. <laughs> a non-judgmental way, just observing. There's my self-awareness. 
and then say, I might have some mixed emotions around it, but I'll just go ahead and, and buy it. And then sit down, and can I just really, really enjoy that jelly donut? And be there with the flavors and the taste sensations. My taste buds really like sugar. And so notice it in a non-judgmental way. And then, you know, 10 minutes afterwards, just be there for me with like the sugar high. It's kind of fun, you know. 20 minutes later, in a non-judgmental way, curiosity, just be there with the sugar crash. It happens. And then to be there with the craving for the next sweet item. And so we're training ourselves with a self-awareness to be there through the entire arc of uh, our relationship with that behavior. We can do the same with physical activity. Like just about everybody feels good after physical activity, often for hours. And we can often shift our relationship with physical activity, doing it to just maximize the enjoyment within the limitations of our body and our, the things that we personally enjoy. We do similar with alcohol use, smoking. You know, Ty talked about if we're going to quit smoking, you know, do we need to really quit or can we just smoke mindfully? <laughs> and be there with the whole arc of it, including the craving, but also the enjoyment, be there with the chronic cough in the morning, just be there for the full experience. And then often insights can arise around how we want to shift if we want to shift. And so another piece that meditation helps with is attention control, you know, just being there with the object of meditation, whether it's our breath or an object of the body or sound or whatever it is, we get better and better at controlling where we place our mind, where we choose to. So that if we have some insight arise, can we actually act on it? And when we get better at placing our mind where we choose to, we're better at actually acting on what our insights are sharing with us. So lots of us have insights on what would be good to help us with our health behaviors, but whether or not we actually act on it is another thing, and the meditation training can potentially help us act on it by actually allowing us to just get better at placing our mind where we choose to, in terms of making that healthy eating choice or whatever, whatever it is. And then the third piece is around emotion regulation, so that it can help us just take a step back from our thoughts, emotions, sensations, knowing that they're just thoughts, they're just emotions that we don't necessarily need to act on unless we choose to. And can we start to um, allow the meditation, the mindfulness training to help regulate our emotions so that we're turning to that rather than maybe, say, turning to a drink of alcohol just to release, or uh, turning to like a tub of ice cream to <laughs> have a break, or to flip on some you know, film that's maybe not so healthy, and to have that sedentary behavior that goes along with it. So that's another framing of just how mindfulness training can potentially influence behaviors. And this is the framework that we've developed for the mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program that we've been testing in a number of clinical trials. We've done similar things with young adults uh, where we look at common determinants of young adult health. Um, Vish, I hope this is okay, but digital media addiction, so there's a certain negative element rather than just digital media use. Um, and so what are drivers of young adult health? Uh, they're often drivers of many of our health. Uh, and can we direct these skills of self-awareness and attention and control and emotion regulation to our relationship with these drivers of, of health? And we've run this through clinical trials as well. So I'll start to show you some of the results, starting with the mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program. And so we ran people through this particular program where we trained them up in those self-regulation skills of self-awareness, attention control, emotion regulation, and then directed those skills towards the relationship with the things that we know influence blood pressure. And they got to pick what path they wanted to go down, whether it was diet or stress reactivity or alcohol consumption or physical activity. So they could really choose where they wanted to go. And so we saw nice reductions in systolic blood pressure that lasted through six months, clinically uh, relevant reductions uh, that translate into about a 10% drop in cardiac events like heart attacks and stroke. We found nice improvements in adherence to the DASH diet. Uh, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. It's the most evidence-based diet for bringing blood pressure down. It's similar to a Mediterranean diet, but just often lower in salt and more Americanized. And when we looked at other mechanisms, including, say, that self-awareness, we found nice improvements in self-awareness. And then we ran what are called mediation analyses to see if the change in self-awareness from this program actually translated into changes in diet 
and about a third of the effects on diet were actually happening through improvements in self-awareness. We've looked, done brain imaging, including what we call DTI, which is a certain type of MRI, like magnetic resonance in imaging, that measures the flow of molecules through neural networks, but it also measures the flow of molecules uh, through uh, the walls of the neural networks that indicate damage. So with hypertension, there's often more pressure in the nerves, uh, in, the, in the fluid in the nerves, and that can cause damage to the nerves that cause them to actually get leaky, and the fluid actually flows up the wall of the nerves instead of through it. And so we found that there's actually less damage happening in certain areas of the brain with the nerves uh, that we measure through this radial diffusivity, including in the left cingulum uh, that's involved like in emotion regulation. Um, and that those changes are actually associated with changes in self-awareness. Uh, and we also found increased, uh, basically, connectivity in the brain between areas of like the hippocampus that connect into the insula that all are also involved with uh, recalling memories related to emotion regulation. And we also found improvements in sedentary behavior too. So that framework started to work out as we actually really tried to delineate what are the active components and then to build an intervention around that to change behavior and to influence uh, blood pressure. If we look at the impacts in young adults, uh, this is um, a mindfulness-based college program for young adults that we developed. Uh, our primary outcome that we pre-registered um, on this website called clinicaltrials.gov, but it's basically a summary score of major drivers of young adulthood health, including things like diet and physical activity and body mass index and stress and loneliness and sleep. We put them all into this one uh, uh, summary score and found nice improvements in uh, those going through the mindfulness program compared to control. If we look at some of the particular components of, of those factors, we found nice reductions in sedentary behavior, improvements in sleep quality, improvements uh, in depression symptoms, uh, and uh, loneliness. And um, one of the ways that we scaled it up at the request of young adults was through writing a book uh, that brings the, those clinical findings into like a self-help book for young adults. Um, and so then we've done quite a bit of work on like how to adapt mindfulness-based programs to different populations and contexts. I presented on this in the workshop last night. Uh, but one of the things that we really focus on is what's called the warp and the weft. And, uh, and so, with um, textiles, like with weaving, the warp are often like the vertical threads that give the structure uh, to the fabric. And then the weft is where the color comes in and the patterns. And so when we're thinking about mindfulness-based programs, we're often thinking about what is the warp, like the foundational elements, and then what is the weft and the ways that we adapt it, say, to be delivered through an app or uh, to kids or to veterans or to specific health conditions like hypertension. And so often we think of the warp as, say, the foundational Buddhist psychology. Maybe it's the four foundations of mindfulness or uh, the four noble truths or the noble eightfold path or the seven factors of awakening, you know. And, and so how do we have elements that are fundamental in there and then work around that often in a secular kind of way? And so one of the directions that I've been going is um, in this next book I'm writing around blood pressure reduction is to anchor the warp in the seven factors of awakening and the four virtues. And so when we think of the seven factors of awakening, the first one, surprise, surprise, is mindfulness. And so I'd even invite you for a moment, let's like maybe try this on for size, kind of keeping in mind the behavior that you're like holding lightly that you might like some shifts around. So even taking a moment to like close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. Maybe come to an anchor point, like an object of meditation, such as the breath or Maybe a part of the body or sound, some kind of object of meditation. And 
Just noticing the thoughts and letting them pass, kind of like clouds in a blue, clear blue sky. And inviting our awareness to be with that object of meditation right here, right now. And then even bringing to mind that behavior that we're working with, maybe it's diet or physical activity or sleep or alcohol, substance use, time in nature, whatever it is. As you're ready, allowing the eyes to open. And so the second factor of awakening is curiosity. That's also translated as investigation of phenomena. And so can we just be curious about our relationship with this behavior? You know, as Ty talked about, can we be with it kind of like a parent would, a crying child, just caring for it, whatever it is? In time, as it settles, can we look at like the root drivers of that behavior? Even inviting you to do that now. And so, for example, we had a participant in our program I'll call Julie, who had uh, four pregnancies, um, but two births. And so she'd had a couple of miscarriages that were very difficult. And the births that she did have um, had some trauma associated with it. And um, she suffered from postpartum depression uh, and took medication for that that caused some weight gain. And her husband was pretty insensitive about the weight gain. And so she started to just block off her body. She didn't trust it. And she didn't want to listen to it. And fast forward 40 years, she came into our program uh, working with obesity and diabetes and hypertension. And so she started to work, say, with the body scan and connecting with her body more and realizing that she did have a block there. And she started caring for her body more and having that insight around that block and that desire to care for it more. And so that started leading to the third factor, which is energy. And so that insight can like lead to energy. And in her case, she started, for example, making green smoothies in the morning instead of eating a bowl of cereal. And the green smoothies would stick with her more rather than the cereal that would get digested quickly and she'd be hungry by mid-morning. And she started to even feel more energy from that, from the greater nutrition, for example, and from the shift. Uh, and so that energy can then lead to joy, that fourth factor. There actually seems to be an ordering often of the factors, that the one leads to the next. And so she had that joy that came through the changed diet. She'd started playing around with her physical activity. She was able to afford a personal trainer and that really worked for her and gave great joy. That then led to ease. And so when we're starting to align our body with sort of just the natural ways that nature works, we're aligning ourselves to be giving us our, the nutrition that we need to move their body the way that it's uh, meant to, to have meaningful personal relationships and adequate sleep, for example, maybe letting go of the highs and lows that can come from excessive alcohol and substance use. Ease just kind of comes. And so she started to notice that more in her life, which can then lead to concentration. So instead of having those distractions that can come from the highs and lows and the aches and the pains and all the other elements that can be driven by our behaviors, if we have that ease, it can allow us to just settle in and be right here with that task or with that loved one or whatever it is that's best expressing who we are which can then lead to letting go. So there's a story of the Buddha and meditating in a grove in the forest with his monastics and 
They're there and suddenly like a farmer bursts into the grove and says, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I've, I've lost my cows. Has anyone seen my cows? And the Buddha looks at the farmer and he's like, I'm sorry, we haven't seen your cows. And so the farmer runs off in another direction and as he leaves, the Buddha looks to his community and says, aren't you glad you don't have any cows? And so what are the cows that we are bringing along to, whether it's around our cravings or aversions or different behaviors, and can we just let them go? And so that's the seven factors of awakening that have been looked at through health contexts for a long time. And they're not complete. If you notice, there's no elements of, say, relationality there or community. And that's one of the reasons why we bring in the four Brahma Viharas, or the, also known as the four virtues, or like the four homes that we can live in. And so one is loving kindness. So can we offer that loving kindness to ourselves and those we care for, and to really care for ourselves by offering us these practices that nurture us, that allow us to just become who we truly are, because we're we're nurturing the tank, this vessel, to allow us to express out. The second one is compassion. You know, we live in a moment in history where it's kind of no wonder that so many of us are dealing with overweight, obesity, a lack of sleep, sedentary behaviors. So many occupations now are sedentary compared to a couple hundred years ago. Uh, if we look at food, it's actually amongst the least expensive it's ever been in relationship to inflation. And it's also arguably the tastiest, where the food chemists have got just right in terms of the amount of saltiness and sweet and fat and mouthfeel and long shelf life, which brings the prices down. And there's electricity, so we can stay up late reading or surfing the web or whatever it is. So if we're low on sleep and don't move that much and eat a lot of processed foods, can we have compassion towards ourselves? Because we're just living in this flash of history when there's many conditions that promote that. So to have lots of compassion towards ourselves and others. And then the third element is equanimity. So that say when we're at a gathering with friends or others and maybe there's elements of this that aren't going all that well, say around alcohol or substance use or processed foods or whatever it is, can we just stay steady and to just express who we truly are? And then fourth is once again, joy. And this can sometimes be a little different, like sympathetic joy, joy for others, but Ty talks about how we're so interconnected and interbeing that joy for others is also joy for ourselves. And so if we think of the title of this presentation that was unveiling the new you, the role of mindfulness in sustainable behavior change, when we think about unveiling the new you, in many ways we're just unveiling the you or the me that was already here. And we're allowing those behaviors to support ourselves to become who we already are. And so those are examples of how the science and mindfulness training can come together to potentially foster healthy behavior change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. And I just uh, remind everyone, we'll, uh, at the end we will invite all four scientists up so we can have a short uh, 